All right, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, being here today. Uh, we have our first finalist for the Executive Vice President Provost position with us today, Dr. Mira Komaraju. And uh, she's been on campus all day and, and will be here in the morning. I do want to remind everyone that we have a Provost Search website. And if you type in the words Provost Search on our, on our website, you will get there. It has all the details of the candidates, has ways for you to submit uh, your feedback, has schedules, has the videos from their earlier uh, interviews. And so again, please take advantage of that and uh, give us your feedback as we work through uh, this very important uh, position hire. Um, so today, what, what we're going to do is, um, uh, our, our search committee chair have given me the first, uh, I think, four or five questions to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Komaraju. I will do that. That's probably the first 15, 20 minutes into this. And so then we have another hour and 15 minutes for you to ask whatever you want. We'll have microphones uh, on, on each aisle, so just stand up or raise your hand, get a microphone, and then we will do question and answer up until uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, at 4 o'clock, uh, we're doing a memorial service for the students, faculty, and staff who uh, uh, passed away during the last year. They'll be up in, um, I think, is it in the Welcome Center or the Union Club? Union Club? Union Club. Union Club, so you don't even have to go outside in the rain. That starts at 4 o'clock, and uh, um, if you'd like to attend that, all are welcome as well. All right, so let's get started. Um, Mira, why don't you introduce yourself to this group? Tell us, tell them where you're working, what you're doing there, and some of your the highlights of your career. So good afternoon, everybody. Before I answer the question, I want to take a couple of minutes uh, first of all, to thank the search committee uh, for their full consideration and giving me a chance uh, to be here this afternoon uh, and to uh, participate in this whole interview process. I consider it to be a privilege and honor to be here, so thank you for that. I also want to thank all of you for being present uh, this hour uh, because I know this is a busy time of the semester when you may have a lot going on. Uh, so thank you for making the time to be here, uh, to hear what I have to say, and then ask me lots of questions. Uh, so thank you for that. So in response to your question, uh, uh, President Cliff, uh, I would like to say that I bring multiple identities with me. And if I would capture all of them in one phrase, it would be educator. So at heart, I'm an educator. But I'm also, if I look at the parts of it, I'm a teacher. I'm very dedicated to the classroom, which I miss now that I'm an administrator. I've won various teaching awards that attest to my uh, passion for teaching. I'm also a researcher. My areas of research include diversity in the workplace, more specifically leadership and diversity, as well as student motivation and performance. By training, I'm an organizational psychologist. So in my administrative roles, I've been able to bring my training into play. So I feel very fortunate to be able to do that. Now, when I started out as a faculty member, I didn't plan to be an administrator. It happened to me. Administration happened to me. It began when my department chair of psychology asked me, Mira, will you serve as the director of the undergraduate program? And I took that on with a lot of enthusiasm and found that I enjoyed it. All of the psychology majors were mine, 450 of them. And it was my goal to make them successful. I would meet prospective parents. Uh, prospective students along with their families, about 45 every year, and persuade them, your child should study psychology here. And during that experience, what I learned is that many of our students 
came from homes that did not necessarily prepare them to navigate the academy successfully. So I had the opportunity to facilitate those students' success through various mechanisms. As I was doing that work, the dean of our college asked me to serve as the associate dean and said, Mira, can you do for the 17 departments in our college what you were doing in psychology? So I did that for about a year and a half when our psychology department chair fell sick, and the faculty asked if I would put my name in for the chair position. It is by election, you never know whether you'll get selected or not, and I became department chair. And then our dean left, and the other chairs and directors of the other departments asked if I would apply. It was a national search, and once again, you never know what happens with a national search, and I became the dean. Almost three years later, our new chancellor called me, and I was worried that some department chair had complained about me, and I was running through my head the list of possibilities, like who might have said something uh, about me, and I was prepared for that call. And I was surprised when the chancellor, on our campus, the president equivalent is the chancellor, so the chancellor asked if I would serve as the interim provost. So that is how I came to be the provost at uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And I've done that for about four years. And through all this journey, uh, through various administrative positions, uh, where I'm just sort of scaling up the work that I've been doing, i found that I love what I do. It gives me a chance to make a difference in students' lives and to contribute to the academic mission of the university as well as the entire uh, mission of the university. So I think I'll pause there. Perfect. Um, and, and so, um, um, what what attracted you to Missouri State? So, uh, I, I, just in terms of my own sort of journey, and then Missouri State University. So, having served for about uh, these four years, uh, on and off, I've been asking myself, like, what do I want to continue doing in my life? And so, this at this point, uh, I've come to place where a lot of my life situation factors have fallen into place, allowing me the opportunity to think, do I want to continue forever at SLU Carbondale, or do I want to seek new challenges, new opportunities, and kind of like spread my wings a little bit so that I have some novelty in my life. And at that, as I was looking around, I saw Missouri State University, and there were many features that attracted me to this position. During my four years, and you'll understand my answer when I tell you this, is that during my four years as provost, I've served four different chancellors. So when I looked at Missouri State University, and I saw the stability in leadership, and I saw the amazing work that uh, President Cliff has done, and it's been there for 11 years, the current provost has been here for 11 years, and how that has helped the university really succeed. I looked at all of the performance, uh, the key performance indicators, and saw that MSU is doing really well in terms of uh, its uh, uh, retention rates, graduation rates. Of course, you can always do better and you have goals that encourage you and motivate you to aim higher. But in just in terms of the work that is being done here on this campus, the rich academic programs, the faculty, all of that really appealed to me. And I'm glad to have this opportunity to answer more questions. Very good. Um, you know, as um, you, had, you have a similar position at uh, SIU now. Talk, talk about some of the initiatives on that campus anywhere in your career where uh, you've led the way in supporting faculty, whether it's in teaching uh, or research or service. So when I think about uh, supporting faculty, this is how I think about it. The students come to us because they want to learn from our faculty. The faculty are really central to the mission of the university. Faculty who bring their expertise, their knowledge, their own passion, and their dedication. That's what really makes a difference in the universe. That's what attracts most students. That's what makes students successful. So when I think of that, as 
as the Chief Academic Officer at the University, I do everything possible to provide the resources and support that is needed to make our faculty successful. So for instance, the last post, uh, semester we've hired between 20 to 25, sometimes 30 faculty. When I think of these new hires, I'm thinking that each of these individuals are coming to our campus with potential. They're going to be with us 20, 30 years. What could we do to help them fulfill their potential? How could we help them to be successful? How could I, to the provost's office, to the dean's office, to the department chair's office, help our faculty succeed? So we do this, the different things that we have in place uh, include just the onboarding experience so that the faculty receive the resources they need to hit the ground running as quickly as possible, and not to do it in a one and done way, but to have progressive follow-up opportunities so they continue as they gain experience on the campus, how they can continue to ask more questions, get more answers to continue to be successful. So that is just one part of it, just the onboarding. But then also providing mentoring. That's something that I've really been emphasizing with our deans, is make sure that faculty have that support. They can find their own mentor. They never stop them from doing that. But let's make sure that we intentionally provide them mentors who can help them, guide them, someone they can just go to and ask questions, to through the onboarding, mentoring, connecting them with resources in our center for teaching and learning excellence so that they know where they can get some support with their teaching in terms of their research agendas, providing them the startup, the lab space, the studio space, if they need a graduate assistant for teaching or research, anything that we can do to facilitate their work and then providing professional development opportunities if they want to go for conferences, if they want to write grants, uh, providing them the resources to the Vice Chancellor for Research Office, collaborating and so on. So these are just you know, different ways in which we provide support for our faculty, answer the questions, uh, give them mentoring so as they go through the tenure and promotion process, uh, there are no surprises for them, they get that feedback annually and so on. Very good. Um, we had a uh, town hall yesterday that focused on diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, and it's a critical piece here and, and literally all over, uh, all over the country now. Um, if you could discuss your experience with and understanding of those terms, and then uh, tell us a spe specific initiative that you have led in that area. So uh, in terms of addressing issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, I come to it from different lengths. Uh, so the first one really is uh, from a personal uh, lens. Uh, being a first-generation uh, college student, uh, being a first-generation immigrant, uh, being a woman, and being a woman of color who's lived in various spaces, I try to make sure that my lived experiences and insights I've gained inform the work that I do. So one guiding framework uh, that has been helpful for me is this phrase, lift as you climb. So when I think of that, what can I do in the various roles that I play? Help others succeed, move up, do well, even as I have opportunity and occupy positions of privilege. So that's kind of like a broad framework. So within this, what have I done when I've had the opportunity to make a difference? So I'll just give a few different examples if that's okay. So I mentioned to you, I, was, I started out as the undergraduate program director in psychology. So during my role, as I got to know my students, I found that they were from such diverse backgrounds, a mix of rural and urban, first generation, from underrepresented backgrounds, varied socioeconomic status backgrounds, and many of them didn't have the tools to navigate the academy. I remember one specific example. I, I met some seniors who said, Mira, I want to go to graduate school. When I asked them, 
have you written the GRE exam? Do you have your letters of recommendation? They're like, what are you talking about? And I said, if I had met these students as freshmen, how much I could have done for them. So I said, it shouldn't happen to another psychology student. And so I created a careers in psychology course required for all our majors, freshmen or transfers, and tried to put into that everything I could think of that would help them to be su successful. So this is one example of actually trying to do something. On other fronts, in various positions that I've held, I've encouraged and nominated individuals from diverse backgrounds, but sometimes they can be invisible. I remember going to university-wide committees and not feeling heard. I would walk back to my office thinking, I'm never going back to that committee meeting again. But then thinking that I have to persist and make sure that my perspective is included. So now when I'm in meetings, when I'm with my deans or my, and I ask my dean, I said, make sure that everybody at your table can be heard. Intentionally encourage it, include participation. So that's just you know, some of the ways in which I try to do that, nominating faculty or staff for positions so that our, the, the table, the perspective of the table are more diverse. And I also think of diversity in its fullness, all aspects of diversity. It's not just uh, race or ethnicity or first generation, but economic status, uh, sexual orientation, different religions, different nationalities, different abilities, just ensuring that each and every individual has an opportunity to participate and shape the conversation. Very good. Uh, last question I have, so get ready. It's going to be your turn uh, next. And uh, I, want to, I want to focus externally for a minute. And, uh, you know, so much uh, of, uh, of the work now connects us to people outside the academy, whether it's in our state capital, whether it's in our community, businesses, uh, partnerships with school districts and others. Talk, talk about kind of your perspective on connecting from the provost role with external stakeholders um, and, um, and how you see that kind of unfolding here. So my, my perspective is that the university doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is part of the larger society. It serves the larger society. So in that sense, uh, I've made use of every opportunity I could to engage with the outside uh, external stakeholders. So here are some various examples. Uh, so in my role as dean, as a college dean, I had the opportunity to do a lot of fundraising, meet with our alumni, and so on. In my role as provost, uh, as they've had transitions in leadership, I've had the opportunity to engage with a whole variety of stakeholders in this sense. Every month, uh, we have a meeting with our city uh, manager, uh, a meeting that includes our city manager, our city mayor, the chamber of commerce, various businesses, our legislators, principals and superintendents, community college presidents. So we have the monthly meeting where uh, we, I provide updates on the university, any academic related things that might be of interest to them. And then uh, I've also actively made presentations to our board of trustees, uh, particularly when we had certain transitions in our uh, transfer position where uh, I had to uh, present our updates on the university, give uh, uh, information on enrollment, retention, whatever it might be. And then also uh, a few years ago, three years ago, we celebrated our 150th year of our existence for a whole year. And there were events all over the state as well as outside the state. And I had the opportunity to go to several of these events and step in for our chancellor because there were multiple events going on and uh, really uh, share all the good news from the campus. So those are ways in which I've done that. Uh, what, we also hosted our governor on the campus and that day was my chance to be uh, it. And so there I was uh, welcoming our governor because after a 28-year gap, uh, we got $46 million we're good? Can you hear us? Good job. Great. 
So can you hear me now? I, I don't know where I don't know where I lost you. I'm glad you said something. I didn't just keep quiet and let me talk into silence. All right. So I, all right. Hosting the governor. So our governor was on our campus of, uh, and was there to give us 86 million dollars to remodel our building, uh, and we, we had been waiting 28 years. Uh, so I had that opportunity too. Uh, we meet with our legislators all the time on our campus. Uh, they help us with our recruitment efforts. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was uh, stepping in again for our chance to, to meet with uh, our senators, student advisory council, just encouraging them and uh, wishing them, uh, you know, a, a good time on our campus. So those are just some examples in which I've uh, presented to our foundation board, our various college advisory boards. Uh, just being the face of the university and letting them know how we are doing, answering their questions just like this, sometimes in a forum. All right, very good. And if someone will bring me a microphone <laughs> so I can have one. No, 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 we're not going to pass. That's uh, that, that, that never works. <laughs> All right. Is this on? Yes. Perfect. All right. It is now your turn. You have heard uh, uh, Mira uh, express uh, a variety of, of, uh, of ideas and, and, and describe herself. What do you want to know? What would you like to ask her? Now, the lights are in our eyes, so we can't see you very well. So just stand up, and a mic will come to you, and we'll, uh, we'll begin the question and answer. Who wants to be first? Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. The cost of living in Springfield is If I understand the question uh, accurately, the question is what could be done to uh, maybe make things better for graduate students given the rise in uh, cost of living? All right. So what I would uh, do is uh, I would take some time to at least look at what the situation on the ground is, uh, you know, what's the budget, how are we spending it, uh, and what the request is, uh, how much might the request cost, uh, what what might be possible to explore, uh, what the various options are. If we are not able to address these particular requests, are there other ways in which we can help graduate students? So that's the approach that I would take. Uh, I wouldn't assume to know the answers before I even look at the data, but I would gather the data to look at how many graduate students do we have, you know, what's the amount that they're receiving, what is possible. If we were to increase, uh, the, the stipends, how might it affect the number of graduate students that we could support, because that would be a, a, a sort of uh, an outcome of that. And uh, if it is the subsidized meal plans, well, is that the, you know, the place that we would go to make things better or ease? Can we do it? Can we not do it? What might be the cost of that? Could we cover it in some way? Uh, where could we get that support? You know, if you wanted to do that, do we need to do some fundraising for that? What are the ways in which we can provide that support? So I would look at all sources of revenue to see how we can leverage that and then see what, what is needed, what the gap is. And if we cannot do it right away, can we do it in steps? Are there ways in which the graduate students can help us make an appeal to the foundation or whatever it is, the, the revenue source? Are there grants that we could pursue? So I would look to raise, increase our revenue so that we can meet that. And then to look at our existing allocation of resources to see whether there are ways in which we could make some short-term commitments. So these are some examples of ways and I would try to handle it. All right. 
Next. Hello, you can hear me? Okay. I'm wondering how you work to assure fair distribution of resources across campus, including faculty lines. And we've got a broad variety of, of departments, obviously, and how your decisions would be informed by um, ways of quantity versus quality, quantity of credit hours versus quality of student experience, which often occurs in smaller classes. So if I understood the question, it's about uh, how would I allocate resources in terms of like hiring faculty? And uh, okay, so I, let, let me explain, maybe share an example of how I have had to do it. Uh, so when I came into the provost office in April of 2018, for that fall, a decision had already been made prior that there would be no faculty hires. Because our state had gone through a uh, budget impasse, our uh, enrollments had been dec declining, and so we had, the decision had been made that there were going to be no faculty hires. So I spoke with the chancellor and said, Chancellor, if you don't replace faculty, it's kind of like the kiss of death for an academy. Because on average, we lose about 25 to 30 faculty uh, to retirements and resignations. So if you don't you know, keep ha at least replacing as many as we can, it would be difficult to continue with our instruction. So for the following year, uh, we were able to hire 25 faculty. But I got requests from the deans. I asked the deans, give me all the requests. You can prioritize them, but give me all of them. And there were 100. You can only make 25 hires. How do we prioritize? So through our discussion, what we could agree on is that and then later on, I had to sort of make sure that this message is taken back by the deans to the uh, 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 academic programs and academic peers and the faculty so they understand why we're doing what we're doing. And then in faculty senate and grad council, I had to answer and explain what the logic was. So here was the logic that we sort of discussed and came up with. Faculty lines that could help us increase enrollment immediately. Faculty lines that were needed for accreditation, program that I accredited. Are we going to give up the accreditation or are we going to hire the faculty so we can keep the accreditation? Programs that had such big holes that if you're going to continue hiring and continue delivering those programs, how are we going to do it? Is it possible by interdisciplinary hires? And then hires that are central to the mission of the university. So this is the logic that we use. So for example, in terms of enrollment, Aviation told me, if you can give us some hires, we can increase the number of freshmen that we are taking. Now that is immediate. Now if we increase our freshmen, increase our enrollment, that, that revenue then help us to do future hires. So in a way, just helping that cause. So this was the logic that we've been use, using. So for interdisciplinary hires, more than one program is getting some relief because these hires can teach a variety of courses from this, their own program and other programs. So this is the logic that we use. The following year, received 75 requests. We could do like 33, 34 hires. And that's the logic we have used. And now, most recently, we got like 60 requests. We have done 22 hires for this fall 2022. So in, in ensuring that people understood what the logic was and how those who are waiting will also be taken care of, so you're not waiting for four years in a row, you, your turn will come. But this is how we're going to do it. So in that sense, the resources have been scarce, but they've been used as fully as possible to meet as much of the needs as possible with a short-term and a long-term perspective. Some we can satisfy right away, but others know that their turn will come. All right, next. All right, we'll go to this side, we'll come back. Hello, um, one of the things that you mentioned that I found very interesting was the fact that you worked in an institution that has a department chair model rather than a department head model. So we have a department head model here. What do you think the sort of pros and cons are of those two different models? I missed the front end of the question. Okay. So uh, compare and contrast department head versus chair models. 
in terms of leading it apart. Okay. So, uh, I understand that here we have departments and department chairs. Yeah. Department heads. And uh, comparing it to department... Chairs where faculty elect their head. Okay. All right. Uh, be, be, because on our campus it's all by election. There's no, no appointment. No one appoints somebody. It's by election because uh, the faculty, uh, uh, whoever is leading, whoever is the leader, needs the support of the faculty so that they uh, can be successful. That's the, that's the logic. Uh, so your question is, what do I think about that at, versus appointing somebody? Uh, in general, uh, having been a faculty member, uh, having a sense of faculty, they are independent and critical thinkers. Uh, my support would be for, you know, as much as possible to allow faculty to select the person that they want to listen to or work with. I think that person would have a strong chance for success. But sometimes, the, it is, you could be in a situation where no one wants to be. <laughs> because it's not always a fun job. You learn things about your colleagues you never wanted to know. <laughs> Honestly, that's the first thing that struck me when I became department chair. I was like, wow, this is a different view of my colleagues. So sometimes you have situations where they don't want to step up. Then you have to find somebody. Because from an administrative perspective, you really need somebody to run that unit. And so that, that moment may come to somebody who uh, you know, has sort of the skills, is effective, uh, can get the work done. That, that might be needed. All right, we have a mic over here. All right, let's try it again. Hi. Hello. Yeah. You're good. Uh, yeah, so I have a two part question. Uh, you, you describe yourself as an educator. So if you could uh, talk about your vision as an educator and what the role of a university is in education, are we educating our students to get jobs or is it something more than that? If you could address that. And the second part, I think, is related to the first, you talked about free hiring freezes and so on. We are looking at a demographic cliff that is coming, I think, within a year or two. And uh, everybody anticipates a significant cut in funding, uh, which leads to the point that programs have to be cut. Somehow that has to be addressed. And how do you see yourself? I mean, if you look, programs have to be cut what are the principles that you would be looking for in order to keep program A and cut program B and so on and so forth? So I'm actually interested in what are the basic ideas and the values and principles that would drive you to make such a decision or, or recommend such a decision to perhaps give. Thank you. Okay. If I imagine, if I answer the question correctly, let me just sort of summarize it and make sure our understanding is accurate before I answer the question. So the first one is, uh, what's my vision uh, uh, regarding what the purpose of education is? Is it uh, to help students get jobs or is there more to it? And then the second part is, if because of budget reduction some programs have to be cut, what would be the logic used? All right. So to answer the first question, uh, I would say that as an educator, when I think about what's the purpose of a university, what does it mean to be college educated? I, I, uh, I responded to something similar with a group early this morning and I gave the example, if you have two individuals, one who's not gone to college and one who has. So one has done high school, one has done college. What more do we expect from that person who's gone to college? What do we expect, what do we think this person has gone through? So the way I would think of it is that the hope is that, or the vision is that this student who's gone through college, who's college educated, has been transformed in some way. That is more than just being successful and getting a job. That is good. If we can achieve that goal, that's good, that's important. There's been a financial investment and we want some kind of benefit. But in addition, has the uh, individual uh, thinking changed? Has their approach to life changed? Have they, uh, have they broadened their horizon in some way? Are they more uh, engaged in the community? 
in their civic engagement? Are they, uh, as citizens, more uh, engaged, more participate? Are they contributing as citizens? And then, as they go on as becoming employees, as family members and community members, how can they enrich what's around them? Everyone who interacts with them, how are they sort of impacted? Because this person is now received a college education. So that's how I would think very broadly about it. And I think that all the various uh, disciplines that we offer contribute to that student's education. And so a college educated person is someone who has gained some knowledge and expertise in some subject areas, but also has broadened their horizons, you know, become ready for a global economy. So their, their horizon perspective has been expanded. That's how I would think about it. Now in terms of like uh, cutting uh, programs, I would say that that decision wouldn't be coming from the provost office. It would be engaging uh, the uh, academic programs in that discussion. So just like two weeks ago, our, on our campus, we went through a, a workshop, a two-day workshop, where we engaged a consultant who looked at our data and shared with us and we're going to continue doing that. The faculty were very excited about that. And we're going to do that in the fall, is to share that uh, data with them. For each of our academic programs, what is the uh, scope for this within the state, within the country? How much in scope in terms of is this market already saturated or there's potential for growth? What would be the uh, salaries for people with this degree? What are related degrees that they could look at? So that's, the, that, that's one way of analyzing to start new programs, to invest in current programs, which ones should we invest in, which ones we might want to reimagine, given the data, given the predictions. So instead of just doing it uh, by instinct or by anecdotal evidence, but looking at data and looking at what do the numbers tell us and how can it inform us and let the academic uh, units actually look at it. Uh, for instance, some of our academic programs that were participating saying like, wow, we didn't know that this is the scope of our degree. Now we have the data, we can tell prospective students. So I would say it would have to be looking at the data and looking at trends and not looking just as, at us, but looking at this discipline across the state, across the country. So that would be a more informed discussion, but engaging everyone. Because oftentimes, people who are in the discipline have an inkling of the scope and how it could be reimagined, if needed. You know, as, uh, as enrollment, uh, if enrollment declines, as the question assumes, one strategy is obviously to reduce expenses. Another strategy might be to grow alternative sources of revenue. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience there and as you look into the future, what that might look like for us? Yeah. So in terms of uh, sort of increasing uh, revenue uh, to thinking of just different ways in which we can reach a student, uh, in some of my discussions I've shared that uh, higher education is going through so much of change that it is imperative that we think about more carefully about who a student is. It's easier to think of a student as a traditional, in a traditional model where someone finishes their high school or finishes community college and then comes to study with us. But there are also students who are looking for like what we consider like lifelong learning. So they're adult learners, so there are employees. They could be an organization that has employees and they would like for them to upgrade their skills so they can be more uh, effective or they could be multi-skilled. So can a university participate in that? Or it could be another organization which has employees who are working, but who are looking to improve their skills, and they may go away and work somewhere else, because now they have this new set of skills. So how can we take education to these uh, adult learners where they are, to rethink how we offer the different modalities in which we can offer education? One is by having students come to our classroom, sit with us in 50 minute lectures, three days a week. That's one way. But is there another way in which we can reach students where they are? It doesn't actually have to be between 8 and 4.30. Can it be at any time that they are ready? If a student wants to talk to someone about what's going on with their schoolwork at 2 a.m., is there a way that we can meet that need? Because they're between shifts, or they're getting off a shift, 
So how could we reach an adult learner by different modalities? And then also thinking about what we are offering. We have our, our current students are double majoring and triple minoring, telling us that the traditional packages that we have are not enough to consume them. They want more. So thinking of what we offer beyond our degrees, we, we offer the uh, re, uh, traditional degrees, your bachelor's, your master's, and so on. But you also think of other credentials that individuals might want in a more compressed manner. They don't want. The, they, they may already have a bachelor saying, "Okay, I just need to upgrade some skills." How could that be offered? So thinking of education in a more sort of in a flexible way to be a little more nimble and responsive to what the market needs are. Good. Next, who else has a question? Um, thank you very much uh, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is David Mitchell with the Department of Economics. Uh, questions have been raised about resources. I got another question also about resources as well. And that is that when you look at faculty salaries since 2008, you've seen a steady decline relative to the cost of living. So, for example, in 2008, a faculty member who was making $75,000 is now making $68,000. Same thing for someone making $25,000. And this is not just from the recent inflation, it's a long-term systemic problem. Uh, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts in addressing this and what's going to be your main priority. And then, like the previous question, if we do have a demographic cliff that comes up where the university is now faced with even more constraints, how are you going to balance what is the greatest benefit for faculty, which is a paycheck, not you know, reimbursement for travel and things like that, uh, versus the new economic realities? Thank you very much. So I think the question is about uh, faculty compensation uh, being sort of uh, constrained and not keeping up with the cost of living changes that are going on. And how might that be addressed? I think that was part of the uh, question. Yes. And the second part, I didn't get that fully. This, was there the second part? Yes, ma'am. The second part was when we do have this demographic lift, this competition even more constraint in terms of resources. Okay. Something's going to have to give. Is it going to okay. be back to the salaries? Is it going to be sports? Is it going to be administrators? That would be crazy Jesus. Is it something else? I mean, what, what's going to give up? What's, what are you going to have to give up? So as, as there are anticipated declines in resources, what's going to be impacted? How, how you know, what will be the priority? Yes, okay. Right. So, uh, I haven't done like a study of what is going on here, what the salaries are, but if I were to take your uh, sort of uh, concern, that there are some concerns about n not having the raises keep up with the inflation. So I would say that it's something that I'm familiar with. On our campus, we have not had raises for a long time. And so we, we've had these concerns. Uh, so what we have shared is that the way out is for us to increase our sources of revenue. And to work toward that so that we can then get, get the benefits of that. And so one way that we have done it is that if, if you have constrained resources and you're trying to say, give me, give me, give me, all of us are asking, give us, there are, the resources are not there. So how can we increase our resources would be the first place to start so that then that can trickle down to everybody. So on our campus, we have really worked hard to stem our enrollment decline. Four years ago, we were at 12% decline. Three years ago, 9%. Two years ago, 2.8, last year, 0.8. And our faculty, our staff, and our students have helped us do that work. So our, the new chancellor who came, who joined us recently, just gave everyone a 2% raise that we had not seen in a very long time. But we had to understand how that was going to happen. Because the state was not giving us more appropriations. Enrollment was declining. So where are the funds going to come from? So we have to increase the revenue so that we have not had merit raises literally like forever it feels. We've not been able to do that. We used to have that, but we couldn't. But now we are hopeful that if things get better, we've, we've talked about it on our campus, if things get better, that's one place we can go. And we're expecting an uptick this fall. So just to share with you that sharing the, the logic and the understanding, like how can we all contribute to the cause of increasing our revenue so that we can all benefit. Now, in terms of prioritizing, 
Uh, I, he I heard that the way, if there are benefits, how are we going to prioritize? The way we have done it is across the board, everybody got that. Now, in, in addition, when we had the discussion, suggestions were made. We haven't acted on those, but suggestions were made. Is it possible that uh, we could bring back merit rates for some faculty who reached a certain, established the faculty established the criteria and say, those who reach this will get it first, those who reach this will get it second, and so on. So those are getting input of, in terms of how we are going to address that issue and getting input so that we can uh, work with those ideas as we make decisions. All right, do we have another question? Hi, we've been talking a lot about allocation of resources, and um, for those of us in the, the liberal arts and the humanities and the social sciences, one of the things that we often see is that resources are often recently been allocated away um, particularly at state institutions from those areas. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, um, not specifically necessarily about the, the process of allocating resources themselves, as much as what you see as the value of liberal arts and social sciences to a public university, um, and, and you know articulate your ideas on that a little bit. Yeah. A smattering of applause. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you for that question. Uh, as the former dean of the College of Liberal Arts, that included the arts, the humanities, and the social sciences, I can tell you that I'm very familiar uh, with the concerns that have been that uh, are raised within that question. Uh, and to address that, uh, you know, when I listed the criteria that we use to allocate the resources for hires, one criteria was central to the mission, and so. In that logic, the liberal arts were the, central, were the uh, biggest piece of the puzzle of central to the mission. Because when we think of uh, a college-educated student, every student walks through that college of liberal arts. Whether it's English, uh, communication studies, art, humanities, they take certain credits in their core curriculum. I, I'm not sure what it's called here, but the, like the general education of core curriculum. So that is central. Why is it, if you think of the logic, why is it that we require students to have that core curriculum? Because it's the belief that a college educated student should be steeped in those areas. So one way we've addressed it is actually have a cluster hire. One of the uh, hires that we have is a cluster hire in the uh, Department of Africana Studies. Because we felt that diversity was such an important uh, piece of a college education. For, a, for, for an individual to be college educated, they have to be, have that experience of diversity. That was something that we were going to dedicate it to. So it's just an example of the, the thinking that the arts and the humanities, the liberal arts are central, including the social sciences, to uh, the university. And that there's no shortcut around it. The question is in reference to student enrollments. As we look at projected enrollments and possible decline in enrollments, as people were your preference, the COVID, or not the COVID, actually the cliff coming in with uh, reduced graduation rates of high schools, number of students in high school, and those coming to four year institutions. One of the challenges or charges that's been given to every department is to come up with a strategic enrollment management plan, a way to promote and to help to ensure that we're going to have positive and increase in enrollments. From your prior experiences or past experiences or from the data that you've gathered from the university, what would be your top three priorities to facilitate student enrollments? So top three sort of strategies to improve student enrollment, is that the question? Uh, okay. Uh, I'll try to keep my answer really brief because it's something that I've lived in brief the last four years. Uh, by making enrollment our number one priority on our campus and uh, working very, very closely with our uh, Vice Chancellor, Associate Chancellor for Enrollment Management. And when that position was vacant for over a year, I covered that position, working closely uh, with uh, Student Affairs so we can all work together to increase enrollment. Uh, 
uh, based on those ex uh, the numbers that I shared with you of how we have been able to stem our enrollment decline, I can let you know that uh, we we now believe that there is no like secret sauce that somebody knows and we don't know. That it is possible to increase enrollment. It requires a lot of hard work, a lot of collaboration, uh, a lot of uh, energy, and uh, being relentless, and we can make it happen. So just a, uh, you, you mentioned like a strategic enrollment plan. So uh, w one way that we have uh, sort of tackled it is within each of our colleges, we have a recruitment retention coordinator. So that is the contact person for that college. And we have weekly meetings in enrollment, ma uh, enrollment management. All the stakeholders come together. And we have clearly laid out uh, action plans. Like at, at the time of uh, recruitment, all the things we're going to do to increase the admissions funnel. Now, in the last 17 weeks before school starts, we are trying to yield every admitted student. Have all the strategies in place so that we're all working together to the for the same goal. We have a, a software that we use called Slate. And within that, we get training in how to call students, how to reach out, put the notes over there, and then increase campus visits, have students visit the campus. So essentially, if, if I were to say, okay, what are the top three things is, one is to increase the collaboration within the units that are working on that, so that we are all uh, have synergy in terms of what we are doing, and we are efficient in what we are doing. So in the fall semester, do a lot more outreach. In the spring, we are focusing on yield. What does yield mean? How are we going, who are the admitted students? How are we going to reach them? How are we going to go to them? So we have instituted like uh, initiatives where we are actually going to the community college, doing on-site registration. Uh, we created what is called a ready to register. So as soon as students are admitted, they can raise their hands and say, I'm ready to register. So we are not wait in, in the past, we used to wait for the student to reach out to an advisor to register. But now the advisor is calling them and saying, are you ready to register? Can I schedule you? So these are just various initiatives that we can do, but it requires everyone to work together and have a game plan. And then keep on reviewing it to see how can we improve it. So by connecting with our community colleges, connecting with our high schools, so these are some of the things we have done. But we have also tried at the same time to offer programs where there is student interest. So one is the actual process or logistics of getting the students. The other one is to think of how to attract them and to think of all kinds of students. We have seen the greatest growth in our transfer numbers, not on-campus transfers, but our online. So you look at the data and say, OK, if that's where the growth is, how can we intentionally grow that? So most recently, we instituted a completely online master's program in social work that got us as many students as the ones on ground. But that is intentional. And we didn't put any old master's program online, a high quality social work program to the faculty were willing to just go through the training so that when they engage and have students, they can offer the best experience possible. Because that, that's your reputation too, the word of mouth. So these are just examples of things that we have to do as a team, gather the data, and identify how we are going to increase interest. And then once the interest is indicated, how are we going to yield it? Very good. Uh, uh, interesting that, uh, that you said enrollment is the number one prime priority at Southern Illinois. It's also the number one priority here. Nothing else close. What else do we have? I'll go. I think you can probably hear me. I don't need the microphone. Um, I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about your, uh, your experience and your philosophy and your expectations for shared governance. Uh, what is the role of faculty uh, in helping determine the course of, of the university's choices, uh, and maybe some of your experiences with your own faculty senate. Uh, and I know you have a union, so, so your union as well. Thank you. Chris, you're the first person that, that has ever said, I think you can hear me without a microphone, and we could actually hear you without a microphone. <laughs> so go ahead, Mary. All right. So I think that uh, my deepest understanding of shared governance uh, was solidified after I served on faculty senate as faculty senate president. That gave me a full, uh, because I participated with administration representing faculty and bringing the faculty voice and adding to the discussion helped me understand how important it is for faculty to participate 
In fact, as I was finishing my tour, my appeal to faculty was join in, participate, engage, help to shape what happens on campus. That was my call to faculty, because I felt like faculty have so much to bring. Because what faculty do on campus is not always understood outside the house. Because we know what, faculty know what they do, but not everybody understands that. So I think it's important to engage faculty. That's one perspective. The second is that from an organizational psychology perspective, my own training, uh, in understanding how an organization functions, from that perspective, faculty are so core, they're so central to the university that if you don't bring faculty along, you really can't function. So my perspective always has been to engage faculty, get their input, be transparent, tell them how we are thinking. They may not always agree with what I have to say, but at least they know why I'm saying it and why we are doing what we are doing. And then to take their input. So the analogy that I would uh, share with you of how I think about this is that imagine a room with four walls and a window in each wall. And I'm at one of the windows and I can only look into the room from where I stand. And I have to make some decisions about what's in the room. It wouldn't be very smart of me to just look at what I can see and, make, and decide, because I don't know what's in the room. I have to ask people who are standing at the other windows, what's going on in here? Can you tell me? And do you think this will work or not? Because they can tell me from their perspective and help me make, if I'm the decision maker, I have to make it, but I have to get input from everyone and then make the smartest, fully informed decision and share it as we're discussing. This is what we're thinking, this is what will work. But if you are the decision makers, your judgment that would count, but the judgment includes the perspective. So from that, I would say that uh, in my experience, it takes more time to involve the faculty and to get their input and to have this back and forth conversation and even with the union, but that helps when the decision is made to implement it. So throughout the pandemic, we had detailed discussions with the union, with the, with the faculty, so that we can all understand if we take this decision with the mass, without the mass, how are they going to implement it in the classroom? What support do they need? when they are asked to implement these decisions to provide them the support so that it can be done well. So from my perspective, I would say that shared governance is important because it helps to provide data and more informed decision. It takes time and patience and a back and forth and the understanding that you may not always agree, but at least we know where we are coming from. Anyone else? Hello. All the way back here. Hi. Uh, thank you for sharing previously your experience with and your strategies for enrollment, uh, specifically in terms of recruitment. They sounded really good. I was wondering if you had similar experience with or ideas for retention and graduation, maybe bumping our rates up a little bit. So I can say that uh, Retention has also, when we talk about enrollment, it includes both, recruitment and retention. It actually is more work to bring a student to campus, relatively less work if you were to do it, to retain that student. So uh, when we have made enrollment our number one priority, retention has been part of it. So the last five years, we have raised our, our uh, retention rates by 5%. And it has involved a lot of efforts uh, at all levels, and I'll just give a couple of examples to explain that, uh, 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 or give a, set, a flavor of our efforts in terms of retention, and then I'll address the other part of the, que the question. So in terms of our retention, one, one, one uh, thing that we have done is revamp our uh, orientation course, our first year orientation for course for our students. Uh, we are requiring it of all freshmen. Earlier it was, you could take it in the fall or in the spring. We said, no, everyone does it in the fall. And we have organized it by the colleges because we want our students to make a connection with their academic home and gain a sense of belonging. That this is where I can go. This is, these are people who are thinking like me. If I have a passion for photography, this is where my fa faculty who love photography can talk to me about it. These are other peers, other students. Uh, we have added peer mentoring programs uh, we have not been able to do it 
uh, full scale. That's what, what we're aiming at, but we've already started putting those pieces in place. Uh, we have an early warning system whereby students who start missing their classes the first week, second week, third week, uh, we are checking in on them to see what's going on, do they need any support, any help. So those are just examples in terms of how we are trying to increase retention. These are uh, for, for our first year students. But we are also trying to re increase the retention of our continuing students through various ways. And in terms of our graduation rates, actually MSU rates are much better than what we have. What we are doing is we are first embracing our numbers. Saying this is where we are. This is not good enough. Let's improve. What we have done also is to look inside our university. Some colleges are doing better than others. So what are some best practices that we can learn from ourselves so that we can implement those faster because they are working for our own students? How can we share, share those best practices? In those weekly enrollment management meetings, that's what we talk about. What are some best practices? How can we share them? What are some bottlenecks that are preventing our students from succeeding? Are there courses where they are struggling? Can we provide support for those courses so that those instructors can provide more support for their students so they can succeed. So those are some things that we are doing in terms of our retention and graduation rates. Thank you. A diverse body of staff and faculty has demonstrated to improve learning and retention of a diverse student, staff, and faculty body. What new retention efforts within the university do you intend to start and fund for minoritized faculty and staff? So uh, in, in terms of uh, what could be done to increase the sort of diversity of faculty and staff, there are many things that we can do, but I'll just give some examples. One is to actually identify what the uh, baseline data are. Where are we today? What could we aim for and have some goals? And then how are we going to achieve those goals? So that would be a strategy. Uh, I work closely with our vice chancellor for DEI and collaborate in terms of how could we help this, say when it comes to hiring a, a, a faculty member. What support could we provide? I'll just give an example. Most recently, uh, one unit reached out to me and said, Mira, we had this faculty member who is female from a minority background. We want to hire her, but she will not come unless there's a spouse of hire. So is it possible to also hire the spouse? Because then that will help us land this uh, candidate. Now that requires resources. It requires making, committing resources down. If, if DEI is important, and this was in a STEM area, we say, okay, it's in a STEM area, this will really help because it will uh, diversify the faculty, it will help the students enroll in that program. If this is a commitment, so I reached out to uh, my colleague and said, okay, can you help me on this one? so that we can share some of the cost. And we are also committing future funds. So that particular academic unit had discussions with the dean, with the department uh, uh, head, that this is something we are committed to. So we are going to support it now, but down the line, when there's a retirement or resignation, we need some support back. So that is, it required a conversation, but it was a commitment, and we went with it. So here, just to exemplify that if it is intentional, if it is a goal, then you're going to be a little creative and find a way to support it. You know, we have uh, uh, had reasonable success in attracting um, underrepresented faculty to the university, um, but some less success in keeping them here in a predominantly white com community. I, I presume Carbondale is also a predominantly white community. So talk about the uh, maybe retention strategies of our faculty and staff of color and how has the provost's office been involved in that work? Thank you for that question because uh, it gives me a chance to share a sort of very poignant uh, experience that I had with a colleague. When this was before I was an administrator. So as a faculty member, uh, two experiences. Uh, one is when I was hired myself, uh, along with a few others. Uh, I came to know that other faculty members were being invited out for lunches and dinners, and I knew I didn't receive any of those invitations. So that feeling of exclusion uh, wasn't uh, very pleasant. So it, it kind of stayed with me. And then uh, another colleague, much later, when I was a little more senior, said, you know, Mira, uh, when I'm at work, uh, 
it's all good. I feel connected. But when I go home, it's very lonely. Sort of, you know, not being able to find that community. And that has stayed with me. So when I was department chair, uh, dean as provost, I really pushed for intentionally connecting our new hires with the community. They can find their own community on their own. They're not going to stop that part of it. But can we provide that starting point where, where they're right away included, where they feel that others are looking out for them, that they have somebody that they can go to? Just for you know, basic questions. Where do I stay? Which doctor do you go to? Where do you shop? Where do you buy furniture? Not feeling awkward to ask those questions and to have that friendly presence who can support you. And to also build this other sort of community of scholars. We have groups that are writing groups that come together so that that process of gaining tenure is less scary and you have cohorts. I really encourage the deans. All of your new hires, build that. Meet with them regularly. Ask them to meet together. Ask your department chair to meet with them so that they feel a togetherness within their discipline so they're similar others within the college people that they see regularly that they can talk to. So the, the point is that just to be intentional about it and provide the support and the mechanism and to encourage it. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, I, I echo my colleagues and just appreciating your, your, your wealth of experience in the Serena. I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, either your uh, current institution or if you were to become, if you were to take on the role here at MSU. Um, higher education has issues with siloing. That even within a college or school, that folks don't necessarily know uh, what's happening in the department down the hall. What strategies have you or might you implement to encourage synergy, synergy uh, communication, and collaboration? amongst the faculty across departments and colleges and the university. Thank you for that question because uh, you know there is so much to be gained by having that cross disciplinary sort of exposure. Uh, and there are so many opportunities that we can go after by doing that. So I'll just say that's the framework. That increasing interdisciplinary sort of interactions and collaborations it can be win-win for everybody. So I'll just give you one example of how you know, we ran off an opportunity because of that possibility. So our local hospital reached out uh, maybe even less than two semesters ago saying, you know, Mira, can you help us fulfill a need? And this is for a medical lab sciences program. There's a shortage we're not able to find, and uh, it'll be an opportunity for students to gain clinical experience. So that required getting our School of Medicine, School of Health and Human Services, School of Agricultural Life and Physical Sciences together in the same room. And say, okay, this is something that we have to work together. It's an opportunity for all of us. Because each of our colleges, each of the programs in these colleges can contribute the curriculum. But if you leave it to everybody to do it, there can be what's called social loafing, and it doesn't get done. So I said to one of the deans, you're it. You're going to help us. You're going to be the leader. But these other deans are going to help you. And I connected them with that, the hospital contact person, and we're about to launch it. So I'm just giving an example of how you, you present it as an opportunity where, by collaborating, everyone is going to gain. Because when the new students come and we have more enrollment, we have more hires. It goes back to the faculty. So providing the mechanisms, first of all, believing in it. If I didn't believe in it and I did it half-heartedly, they could figure it out. So believing in it, communicating that enthusiasm, having the meetings very quickly, letting them know that there's accountability, I need an update. After you've had a couple of meetings, let me know how it's going so I can help. So that, that kind of thing where we are bringing an opportunity. Uh, for example, from the northern part of the state, we had a contact saying, we are short of interns in this area. Now there's two or three colleges. So I brought that opportunity, called my deans, and said, look, this chamber of commerce in the northern part of Illinois is reaching out and saying they need interns. Now this cuts across two or three areas. So I don't want you competing, but I want all of you sending so many students 
that will actually increase the internship opportunities. That, that's just presenting the opportunity as helpful for all. Uh, we are also encouraging a lot of interdisciplinary grant proposal writing and then highlighting them when they're successful publicizing. So people see, oh, that work is going on. Hello. Can you elaborate on your vision for the future of online education, as well as meet the needs of online students and other non-traditional students? So this is a vision on online education, online students, and online teaching? Yeah. All right. So, uh, so every Monday by noon, I'm updating our enrollment numbers. And there's one group that is only pointing in one direction. And that's our online presence. And currently, our online presence has been more or less organic. Like whoever wants to participate in is participating. But we are seeing this upward trajectory. And we're saying, how can we be more intentional? About 15 years ago, 18 years ago, faculty used to think that, and I was a faculty member, one of them, used to think that online education was somehow like less than. But we've come a long way. Now we know that online teaching is different. It's not inferior, it's different. How can we do it more effectively? The online student also might need different support than an in-class student. Because to stay motivated and to stay engaged in an online environment is different. It, the strategies are different than in, in, in class. So my, so my thought about it is that online education allows us to teach students who cannot come to our classroom, who may not be able to come to our classroom on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at 9. So how could we provide a high quality online education. There are so many features to online education, and there are so many ways to teach that could be effective in engaging students online. So I, I see that as an area of growth. Uh, it has to be intentional. It has to be good quality. And the students online may need different kind of support. Because they cannot be on our campus and access our support services that students online in, in a way that an on-campus team can. So how can we provide the other kind of support? I, I've heard people say that our current provost works as a provost and then goes home and his hobby at night is being provost. <laughs> <laughs> we all know our jobs are variable from day to day. But would you describe, you're in a provost position. What do you consider sort of a typical day for you right now? If I understood the question right, is it what kind of a typical day? Yeah, uh, it was also a reference to Frank and how he works this job 100 hours a week. That's not the expectation. <laughs> uh, but but tell, tell us about your day as a provost at Southern Illinois. So I have to confess that when people talk about me, they think there are like six of me running around on campus. I've been asked, how many of you are there? Because I enjoy my work so much, I'm pretty much at it all the time. It doesn't even feel like work. Uh, I love attending various events when I'm invited. If I'm invited to three events, I'll let them know and say, okay, I'll be here for 15 minutes, then another bit here, another bit. So I, I, my days are long. Uh, and so, but they're enjoyable. They're not easy. They are difficult. Particularly in this virtual world, I can have like 12 meetings in a day, back to back, and have like six minutes for lunch. So I do bring lunch from home, and I've learned to eat it in six minutes. Sometimes six minutes together, but sometimes scattered. But I, I try to really manage my time very effectively. So if someone wants to see me for seven minutes, they can. It'll last seven minutes. So I'm very efficient with my time. I love my work, and I've learned to prioritize. So lots of things come in, but knowing which ones, so that people feel that uh, they can, I'm approachable, that I, they can reach me and get their question answered. So we're having dinner tonight. Apparently, it's going to last six minutes. <laughs> My wife also says I'm the fastest eater. So, uh, 
Uh, we'll have to fill, uh, fill the time otherwise. Uh, one or two more questions, and then we'll wrap up so that we can go to the memorial service. Anyone else? I've got two questions, if that's okay. So, you spoke about the importance of general education classes to make a well-rounded individual, but currently, I've spoken to many department heads and professors, there seems to be a concern that we can't even require students to take the typical amount of classes in these programs. And there are currently fears within students right now who are currently afraid that they're not going to be prepared to be competitive applying to graduate programs and their success is being limited by the amount of general education. We all want to be great individuals, but we need to succeed in the future. Where do you place yourself on this versus making a well-rounded individual versus preparing students for graduate school like you spoke in your experience? And also, my second question would be, it seems like we have some tough times coming ahead, and you spoke of leaving the University of Illinois because of the instability. It sounds like you've contributed to that problem by leaving instead of improving on it. How do we know you're going to stick things out when things get tough here? Well, in fairness, uh, she has been there over 25 years. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So the first part of your question, I think I'm trying to understand. You said that for uh, undergraduate students, it's difficult to complete the core curriculum courses? No, we have so many core curriculum. It's hardly a comprehensive program that are Okay. So there's so much of core curriculum that you don't have enough uh, space in the curriculum to do your major specific, so you're competitive for your graduate uh, school. Okay, so you think that within your 120 credits, there's not enough there? All right. So I think that would be a concern to share with your, the, the, because the, acad the faculty own the curriculum, to share that with them and, and let them know what's going on so they can compare their curriculum uh, with others in that discipline. So if it is, let's say, um, a, a psychology uh, curriculum. Look at other psychology program. What are their requirements and how are we meeting that? So that, I think that would be the place to start because faculty can make changes to their curriculum. So I, I think that would be to bring the concerns to that particular uh, the body. Now here, I, I don't know what exactly the core curriculum is, but usually most core curriculum is around like 39, 38, 40, uh, uh, 42 at the most. I don't know what the number is here, but in general, so I think that would be faculty own the curriculum. So faculty would have to have that discussion and say, OK, uh, what would be our recommendation? And, and to listen to the student concerns. So that's one part of it. Now, in terms of the, the, the question you asked about like, stability and uh, whether leaving would create instability, uh, I just want to share that you know, we have a new chancellor and, the, and give the chancellor a chance to build his team, which he has started doing. So in, in that sense, I, I think there would be stability in that sense and cohesiveness in that group. And I have been sort of served the four years that I have been able to. All right, one last question. Um, hello, um, I'm asking this question as a department head. And it may, I'm sorry we're gonna have to end on this note, but my faculty, and I think faculty in general, are quite frankly burned out. A lot of what we used to enjoy about the university is leaving us. So I want, and I know you can't redecorate before you're here, so I'm not going to ask you what you would do here, but what are some things you can do to help raise faculty morale, to help faculty do the job, do what they really love doing, which is research, teaching, to some degree service. <laughs> um, but I just wondered how you are addressing, I'm sure you have those issues at, at Southern Illinois as well. How are you addressing that? So and to help department heads who are also burned out. How do we deal with this, especially after COVID and with all of the stuff that's coming down, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry I'm not very eloquent, but I'll leave it at that. So I think the question is like, as a department uh, head, uh, how could that individual who's also experiencing burnout uh, do things to uh, boost like the morale of the faculty and help them feel uh, supported or less burnt out? Is that the question? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think that the, uh, a beginning point is to even be aware of that, have, have an opportunity to listen and find out what's going on. And that 
is done by visiting the units, something that I did as a dean. I visited with the, uh, each of the departments and listened to them. And, and really to, to have a, a sense of the pulse of the uh, faculty. And then to put in place things that uh, faculty might appreciate and enjoy and asking them what they would like. They may have a wish list. We may not do everything. But let's begin to address some of them. So that it's, whether it's like professional development, like some faculty said, you know, we if we could have some opportunity for professional development. We haven't been able to go for a long time. So we say, OK, we cannot give it for everyone, but can we give to some every year? That is something they can look forward to. If it is a retreat that they're looking for, what resources could we provide? These are like one-time costs. They're, you're not making a commitment every year. We say, OK, what is something that we can do? But something that they would like. Not to sit and imagine, okay, this will be, they might like this, but really to get their input and see what we can do and, and to provide the resources. It's a priority, right? If it's a priori priority, then you don't do something else and say, this is what we're not going to do because we're going to do this. And then provide those resources. And disciplines are so different. Different units want different things. And to listen to that and provide that support. It's not a bad question to end on. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, before we wrap up, Kishore, I see you sitting down in the front row. Do you not want to ask a question? You will not. All right. OK. You, you do? Do you have a question? I thought you might. Let's bring Kishore a microphone. We'll get in it. It's coming. Just wait. It's coming. Thank you, President Smart, and thank you. Uh, I have two questions. I only give you one. I only give you one. Okay. I will ask only one. Uh, could you please talk about India? So the question is, can you please talk about India? Uh, what right, I can you, only, you only have like four minutes. <laughs> so go ahead. All right. What I can share with you is that I did grow up in India and came to the United States as an international student uh, to study psychology. And I grew up in the southeastern part of India. All right. That was quick. What's your second one? <laughs> oh, do I get to ask one more? <laughs> oh, OK. Let me make this a hard question. Okay. <laughs> At your university, I'm sure you are admired by many, many employees, but I'm also sure that you face opposition from several employees. What about those who are opposing you? Why were they opposing you, if at all? So I'll be the first to admit that uh, when you become an administrator, the first thing you have, to be, you have to accept is that you have to make hard decisions. And you know, you, you, you've heard of the phrase, don't go into the kitchen if you don't like the heat. So you have to be comfortable with making those hard decisions. It's easier to make that easy decision. But the position requires you to make hard decisions. And when you make those hard decisions, you have to think through, can I live with myself when I have made that hard decision? Can I face myself in the mirror and know that what I did was right? If I can do that, then I have to do the right thing. Because when you make the right decision, even if it may upset person A, the message it communicates to the rest of the campus is this is how things are going to be. So if it is a fair, objective decision that's good for the university, then make it. Because you are in that position to do it. That's your job. If you cannot do that job, step away. Let somebody else who can do it, do it. But don't be in that situation and take that easy way out. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to make tough decisions. And I know I could make that easy decision. Everyone would leave the room smiling. But in the long run, is that the right thing for the university? Because I'm in that position only briefly. Whether I leave of my choice or I'm removed, 
we are just there temporarily. In any leader, in any administrative position, you're just there temporarily. You're there while you're there and then you're gone. However, the decisions you make last. The university lasts. So you have to do what's right for the university, not what you are comfortable, what's comfortable for you. So that's been the guiding uh, principle. So yes, there are people uh, who may have received uh, tenure denials or promotion denials, who may not be selected. People compete for positions. Uh, I have to select them. I, you know, three people, I cannot select all three for one position. So two may be unhappy. But I, my sense is at least they would appreciate the uh, fairness with which the decision was made. They may not agree with the decision, but the fairness is what I hope I try to achieve. Very good. Please, Please help me uh, thank her for a great talk about Thank you. All right, and uh, with that, we're adjourned. And again, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Remember to fill out your evaluation surveys and get those in. Thank you, everyone.